Welcome to the video for section 1.3. Today we're going to be covering average rates of change of functions. We will be using graphs to determine whether a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. We're going to use graphs to locate the maxima and minima. That's local maxima and minima and absolute max and absolute min. Now let's start by defining the average rate of change. Symbolically, this looks like the Greek symbol delta. So that's change in y over delta x to change in x. And this is the change in output. This is the change in the output values over the change in the input values. We can find that by subtracting two y values and dividing that by the difference of their corresponding x values. So finally, this just becomes the function evaluated at x2 minus our function evaluated at x1 divided by x2 minus x1. And as an aside, note that f evaluated x1 equals y1. So all I did was replace this y1 with f of x1. Similarly, our function evaluated at x2 should give us y2. And that is why these are replaced here. All right, so with that, let's look at the first example of the day. Example one, we're going to compute the rate of change from a table. The change in temperature in degrees Fahrenheit as the altitude changes in thousands of feet can be modeled by linear regression. The table below includes values from the regression equations of temperatures recorded during a particular delta flight. Find the average rate of change in temperature over the first 25,000 feet of elevation gain. So we want to know the average rate of change in temperature over the first 25,000 feet of elevation gain. So I want delta Y divided by delta X. So I'm going to let this be my function. So these are my inputs. So our altitudes, I'm going to call these x's, and these are my function evaluated at x. So I want to evaluate at 25,000 feet. And over the first 25,000 feet, that means we start at the ground when the plane takes off at zero and evaluate the rate of change until we reach 25,000 feet. I'm going to divide this entire quantity by 25 minus 0. And let's see, oh, let's see what we end up with. Here is, or here are the quantities we're interested in. So we have negative 19.61 minus 72.5 divided by 25. Pull out your calculator for this. You should end up with 92.11 divided by 25, which is about negative 3, and then a decimal place, 6844. So if we round this to do two decimal places, we see that temperature has changed an average of negative 3.68 degrees Fahrenheit per foot of elevation gain. That means for every foot of elevation gained, the temperature will drop by negative 3.68 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's look at our next example, example two. So we're going to compute the average rate of change from a graph. So given the graph of f of x below, find the average rate of change between the interval. And I'm going to add in a second interval. So let's do this interval and 
zero, one. If you have module version two or later, you don't need to write this in. This is already typed in. So really quickly, this is our x-axis here. This is our y-axis. And our graph goes on forever in either the positive and negative direction. So let's first look at this interval from negative 1 to positive 1. So from negative 1 to positive 1, I want to find the average rate of change. And actually, let's name our function. Did we name it already? We did. This is f of x, so I'm just going to remind myself the name by writing it down here. And so I'm going to evaluate this at f of 1. So the function f evaluated at 1 minus the function f evaluated at negative 1 divided by 1 minus negative 1. So at 1, here's the input of 1, the domain value of 1. The output or the range value is up here at 4. That is this ordered pair of 1, 4. So I know that I have 4. And what am I going to subtract from this 4? If you notice, if we want to evaluate at negative 1, we go here. And we go all the way up until we intersect our graph, which is at positive 2. So that is this ordered pair of negative 1, 2. So we have 4 minus 2 divided by, and this is 1 minus a negative, so that becomes a positive 1, 1 plus 1. This becomes 2 over 2, which is just 1. Now what did we find? We found the slope of this blue dotted line here. The slope of this line is 1. So on average, the slope will change by 1 from negative 1, 2 to the point 1, 4. This is a little deceiving because the graph goes all the way down and up. So let's do this interval now from 0 to 1 so you can see how this affects the average rate of change. If you notice, if I were to draw a little imaginary line from 0 to this value here, 1, 4, so from the origin to the point 1, 4, it, it looks as if this line is going to be steeper. So it's going to have a larger slope. So we should end up with a value that's larger than 1 for this case. So let's go ahead and work in a purple. So I want the change in y over the change in x. So I'm going to evaluate this at 1 minus the function evaluated at 0 divided by 1 minus 0. We know that our function evaluated at 1 is 4. And you notice here this point is the ordered pair 0, 0, the origin. So we have 4 minus 0 divided by 1, since 1 minus 0 is just 1. This becomes 4. This slope of this line connecting these two points is definitely steeper. We have a rise of 4 at over 1, whereas this line we had a rise of 1 over 1. So we just found the average rate of change between these two points. With that, turn to page 11 of your modules. Continuing on the top of page 11 of the modules with example 3, let's find the average rate of change of an expression. Find the average rate of change of g of t equals g times t squared plus t minus 6 over the interval, closed interval from 0 to a. So what we're looking for here is the average rate of change. So we're looking at the change in y divided by the change in x. So we have g of a minus g of 0, the quantity divided by a minus 0. This tells me to evaluate my entire function at a. And 
that would give me 5 times a squared plus a minus 6. And I'm going to subtract my entire function evaluated at 0. So that's 5 times 0 squared plus 0 minus 6. I divide this entire quantity by a minus 0. So I have 5a squared plus a minus 6. If you notice here, this term is 0. This is 0. So I just have minus and then a negative 6 in the bracket. So minus negative 6 divided by a. And that is, since a minus 0 is just going to be a. So now I have 5a squared plus a minus 6 plus 6 divided by a. Positive 6 minus 6 is 0. You can also think of this as negative 6 plus 6. Either way, we get 0, however you think about it. So I have 5a squared plus a divided by a. Now I can factor out this a to end up with 5a plus 1. And I'm going to ask everyone to use some caution here. Very often I see students do something like this and write this equals 5a squared. That's wrong. Don't do that. That's very sloppy. When you cancel something out, canceling is undoing div uh, multiplication. So it's another way, a very shorthand sloppy way of saying division. So we need multiplication since multiplication, in this case a times this quantity, is only undone by division. So let's get rid of this here. Don't do that. We can, however, cancel these out. That's because a divided by a is going to be 1. Continue. This leaves us with 5a plus 1, and we are finished. Now let's discuss local extrema. A function, f, has a local maximum at x equals b, so it's some value b, if there exists an interval, and here b is sandwiched between a and c, this open interval, since a and c are not included, such that for any x on this open interval, we have, and remember, this is a maximum, so that means this b is going to be greater than or equal to our function evaluated at any other value. So our function evaluated at b will always be larger than our function evaluated anywhere else if it is a local maximum. So I'm going to quickly draw a graph so we can see an example of what this looks like. Here's our x and y axis on our Cartesian coordinate system. And say I have this graph here. This is f of x. So here I have, say, my a. Here is c. Here's b. This point here is b, comma, f of b. And that is my local maximum. It doesn't matter if there is something up here that's higher. It is outside of this little window. We're looking at this very narrow section from A to C, and this is the local maximum in that narrow window. It doesn't matter if I have a point up here on this function. In this window, this is locally the maximum. Similarly, we can have a local minimum. A function f has a local minimum at x equals b if there exists an interval, so another open interval, B is sandwiched between A and C such that for any x in this interval, we have, and remember we're looking at a minimum, that means f evaluated at B is always going to be less than or equal to f evaluated anywhere else. Now what does this look like? If you notice, I'm purposely drawing my Cartesian coordinate system differently, and I'm going to draw a different graph. This can be applied to any function. It's not, oops, that's not that great of an understand. This can be applied to any function. So it doesn't matter what our graph looks like. Here's f of x. So if I have a is here, if I have c here, this value would be b, and this low point would be b, 
comma, S, and C. That's the ordered pair I end up with. And no matter where I am on this window, from here to here in this little section, this will always be my lowest point. Now we're going to look at example four, identify local extrema using a graph. We need a calculator for this, so please get out your graphing calculator. So we're, here we have a graphing calculator. It would be a good idea to get used to using a graphing calculator. There are a lot of amazing things you can do, and you'll really be at a bit of a detriment during your the rest of your well, math, academic career, if you don't know how to use something like a calculator to your benefit. So example four, we want to use this graphing calculator to find the local maximum and minimum of the function below. I have f of x equals three over x minus three plus x divided by two. So you're going to go here in your calculator to the y equals Let's go to y equals. Let me write down some instructions. So we want to enter our function. Into ti. Using the y equals button. So once you're in the y equals. Here you're going to type in 3, then divide, open up a parenthesis. If you don't open a parenthesis, you're going to type in 3 divided by x minus 3 without a parenthesis, which is different than 3 divided by x minus 3. Now go ahead and type in your x. Here's the variable button up towards the top next to your alpha and stat button minus 3. Let's close our parentheses now and add x divided by 2. Now when you go to your window, I would start by going here, number 6, zoom standard. And that'll start your graph. So I went to the zoom button. Scroll down to number six, standard. And this should always just be a jumping off point. If I notice there wasn't much going on here, say it's going up higher or more to the right or more to the bottom left, then I could go into my window button and adjust the minimum. So this tells me that the horizontal axis, so the x axis, goes as low as negative 10 and as high as positive 10. And these little hash marks are scaled by 1. Now if I look at my window again, the y values, the vertical axis is similar, goes as low as negative 10. That's negative 10. This is positive 10. And these are also scaled by 1. And I would play around with those if the zoom standard isn't working well for you. So now we need to find both the maximum and a minimum. So let's take a look at each of these. This one here in this neighborhood seems to be the highest point. So this is our maximum. Let's find this one first. So I want you, I want you to hit this blue second button and then the calc. So we're going to hit second plus the calc button. Well, technically we hit second plus the trace button and that gets us into the calc menu. to access the calc menu. In this menu, you're going to go here to number four. So scroll down to number four maximum. And you can use your arrow keys for this. So I'm going to leave this here. You want to pick a, a bound to the left and you can move your cursor until you're on the left. I think this is a good left bound. And notice it made a little arrow here denoting our left bound. So now we, wa we want to do the same and find a rightmost bound. I always overshoot it a little bit. But as you work with this, you can get comfortable and find what works best for you. So this is our window. This is our interval, kind of like we were here 
our A and our C. This is our A, this is our C, and we're trying to find where this B is. So now notice our calculator says guess. So you want to find a spot and guess and hit enter. And there it is, our local maximum. So our max, and I'm running out of space here, so I will write the maximum here as 0 0.5. Oh, that's a negative? No, it's a positive. 0.551, comma. I'm still going to run out of space. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to do something you can't do on your own notes, and that is I'm going to kind of shift everything over since I did not leave enough space. So our max, our local max, is at 0 0.551 comma, and that's this value, all the way at negative 0.949. That's the max. Now to find the local minimum, do the same thing except scroll down to number three, minimum. And let's underline this one in green. So our local minimum. So again, we're going to hit the second button, then the trace button to access the calc menu. And here at number three, you scroll down to minimum. You can also hit the number three, and that'll have the same effect. And so we're on the same curve. I don't want to be on this curve, so we just have to keep scrolling over to the right. And now I'm on the correct curve. That's a good left bound. So I'm going to hit enter. Then I'm going to scroll to the right of where I think the minimum is. That's good. I'm going to press enter again. And then I'm going to guess. I think my minimum is right there. Let's see. My guess was not so bad, not the best, but here is my minimum. It is at an x value of 5.449 and a y value at 3.949. Let's continue by discussing decreasing and increasing functions. A function f is decreasing on an open interval if f of b is less than f evaluated at a for any two input values a and b on the given interval where b is greater than a. So what this is telling you as you're traveling along your x-axis and getting to the larger value, the function is getting smaller and smaller. Let's take a look at what this is like on a graph. So I'm going to draw my function here, f of x. Of course, this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis. If this is a and this is b, here's a comma f of a, here's b comma f of b. And if you notice, b is larger than a. As we travel along the x-axis, values get larger as we go to the right. So b is larger than a, but the va function evaluated at b yields a smaller output than a. Since as we travel vertically, upwards, you get larger. So since this function is going down, it is a decreasing function. Similarly, a function is said to be increasing on an open interval if f evaluated at b is greater than f evaluated at a. And again, for any two input values where b is greater than a. What does this look like? Let's take a look. So here's x, here's y. And let's draw this function here. This time I sketched out a linear function. Here's a, here's b, here's a, f of a, and here is the ordered pair b, f of b. If you notice, as we go in the increasing horizontal direction, 
the value of the output of the function also increases. So this is an increasing function. Think of it this way, decreasing functions are getting smaller along their vertical axis, so they're going downhill. Increasing functions are getting larger along the vertical axis, so they're going uphill. So this is downhill and uphill. Go ahead and turn to the top of page 12 of your modules. Let's find intervals where this function is increasing or decreasing. So if we assume this function goes on indefinitely in either direction, that's what those arrows tell us. There's my x-axis and my y-axis. We know that the increases happen on the uphill. So here's one uphill, two uphill. So it's increasing. And let's do this uphill first from 0 to positive infinity. And I write positive infinity because it goes on and on forever. It's just going to keep going on forever along the x-axis. And then at 0, I'm going to have a parentheses. And we'll discuss what's happening exactly at 0 shortly. But it's not actually getting any bigger at 0. It's only increasing right after 0. And notice here we come from negative infinity to negative 2. And that's increasing. And we just need to glue these two intervals together with this symbol, with that union. Now the decreasing is the downhill. This is my downhill. That's the decreasing portion. And that happens from here at negative 2 all the way through 0. The last concept we need to cover in this section is absolute extrema. These are absolute maximums and absolute minimum. The absolute maximum of f at x equals a is f evaluated at this a where f evaluated at this a is greater than or equal to f evaluated at x for all x in the domain of f. So the big difference between a local maxima and an absolute maxima is where are we getting our x's. In a local maximum, we're only taking our inputs from a particular interval, whereas for an absolute maximum, we consider the entire domain of the function. And you can think of this as the largest output value. The largest output value for any x that is an input for any input in the domain. Visually, an absolute maximum would look something like this. Let's sketch our Cartesian coordinate system. And I'm going to put in a little upside down parabola here. So here is A. So when x equals A, so along the domain, this A is in the domain, here is f evaluated at A. And no matter what other value we look at in our function f of x, this point here, f of a, is the highest point. So it's the largest output value, algebraically, or visually, it's the tallest point, the highest up point on the graph. Similarly, we have an absolute minimum. The absolute minimum of f at x equals b is f of b, where f evaluated at b is less than or equal to f evaluated at all other x in its domain. Again, we look for all other values in the domain, and b is some value within the domain. Let's go ahead and look at this visually. So 
So I'm starting off again by drawing my Cartesian coordinate system. And I'm going to draw a slightly more interesting looking graph here. It's not quite a parabola, it's still a polynomial. And here is B, some value in the domain. And here's this low point, F evaluated at B. No matter where I'm looking on this pink function, F of X, every other point on this function is going to be higher up. So this is as low as you can get is the absolute minimum. Example six, identifying absolute extrema using a graph. Find all absolute maxima and minima of f of x below. So if you notice, I restricted this graph. The domain is not all real numbers. The domain is from negative three to positive one and a half, 1.5. And this is my graph, f of x. And let's look at the highest up point. So here is the tallest point. This is my absolute maximum. And it occurs when x equals negative 2. And we end up with the ordered pair, negative 2, comma 2. Now what about the lowest points? Let's look for some low points. So if you notice, we have one here. We also have one here. This graph has two absolute minimums. They occur when x equals negative 3 and x equals 0. These give us the ordered pairs of negative 3 comma negative 2 and 0 comma negative 2. So we have two absolute minima and one absolute maximum.